We are now live, um, which means it's going to take us like two minutes for people to get here. But I just asked you about your day and your dogs, so you can't really <laughs> tell me that again. I mean, I could definitely tell, tell you again. Yeah, tell me the dog story again <laughs> while we see if people pop in. My, my mic check story that I told Ringo so I could just talk about things for an extended period of time without saying ch check one, check two. Um, went to the dog park today with my roommate's dog, who's a very large black lab. Look at the dog. She's right there. Doggo. And my dog, who's way over there being a pug. Um, and it's a very nice day. And there was a lot of, a lot of big dogs at the park. Uh, River ran around a bunch and played and got in some tussles. And then she was very bad at fetch and got her her tomato tennis ball stolen yeah, by her, a very nice boxer. Her uh, sentient tomato looking thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it was really cute because I was like, I was texting my roommate in one of our group chats about River being a useless dog and losing her ball after one throw. And then and then I was like walking over to like the area where the dogs were to try to find the tennis ball again. And then like ended up taking a video. I was like, hey, look, I found it. Because the boxer was running around and like squeaking it. Um, and it was really cute. I like dogs a lot. They're and great. Get to see so many of them. Well, we have three people here. What's up, Josh? He's uh, chimed in. I don't know who else is in the chat. But um, so um we're gonna get started on our actual topic <laughs> that we've talked about dogs so i have with me beth hammer um she is uh been coaching um the hmb uh women's team for last year uh, or i don't know if it's officially coaching or what you'd call it but um some sort of yeah, trainer I... for them right yeah uh, uh so yeah uh, i'm like i've been acting as the like more sort of training coach for uh, the team Matigo, uh, which is largely uh, the HMB women's team. But like we've started doing tournaments all in a, like uh, on our own and going to IMCF tournaments as well and uh, and some of that stuff. But um, but just that core group of girls that was like the 2019 uh, Battle of Nations team, sort of that core group. Um, so yeah, so I've been coaching them um and for like the last uh like year and a half, year and a half yeah. um that i've taken on a much larger coaching role with them um as well as like i've been coach um i've been doing hema and and latosa escrima for the last uh, almost six years now and, and, and as an instructor correct right not just uh, so as a fighter as a practitioner for six years and then as a coach and instructor for sort of uh slightly less than that okay um, Highland. What's up, Mikey? Uh, and yeah, I thought there was another thing that I do. Mostly that. Well, um, coaching those things. What? Coaching those things. I also yeah. like, um, you know, included in sort of like the just general mixed training it includes a lot of wrestling, and um, I coached a women's wrestling practice for a little while as well. So. Right. Um, I've been to a couple of your classes. Um. I find you to be a great teacher and you hit me up the other day saying you wanted to talk a little bit about sort of gender differences and coaching and sort of how that works together. Um, so that's what we're going to go over. Uh, what's up, Valis? What's up, Brian? Um, so that's what this chat's about. Um, Beth has says she's she has a bunch of notes that she's prepared. So we're basically just going to let her talk. And then if you guys have questions in the chat put them in and I'll bring them in if they're relevant or we'll probably just take them at the end. Um, and I might pipe in in the middle, but I'm going to try to just let Beth go. Um, cause she's got a plan and we're going to follow it because <laughs> it seems to work pretty well in my experience. So sweet. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, and thank you so much Ringo for, for giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic. Um, it's a pretty, like, it's a pretty important one cause this is something that like just in the last month, there were two big, like we, there's some Facebook groups uh, that are like women and women in Bohurt and women fighters. Um, and there are a couple of questions that came up recently kind of sort of on this topic of one of them was like, how do you uh, train with your, with your partners, like your romantic partners? Um, and how do you deal with some of the, like the struggles there? And then also just a general one of like, 
how do you, you know, like just feeling, feeling really down about yourself after practice and, and, and particularly practice with a lot of men and like where, uh, like how that can be kind of rough. And not only that, but like a thing that, you know, particularly when I'm training or working with, uh, newer groups of women, or even just like with team Medico and all of that, like we've spent a lot of time talking about how to navigate, uh, being in coaching and coaching and training environments with like that are predominantly men and how can you like learn while you're in that and part of that is uh you know a topic for for women and for us to talk about amongst ourselves of uh like being really taking control of your own learning and making sure that you are advocating for yourself and if someone's talking your ear off about something tell them to stop um, or ask them nicely to stop if they're going to be weird about it. Um, but eventually ramping that stuff up to like, you know, back off. I need to, like, you're not my coach. <laughs> um, and, and so there's a lot of stuff around that, but there's also stuff that, and the big thing that I wanted to kind of talk about, uh, today was the stuff around like us as coaches, particularly men as coaches, uh, in mixed environments, like how can you, be do a better job of taking care of women and um pr- giving them the best opportunity for success um and and basically the kind of my the, the sort of thesis around this is that stop treating them like little girls uh and and actually really like because the way that you coach women is actually basically the same as the way that you coach men if you are coaching all men and not just a 24 year old athletic male and only coaching to that single sort of type which is a lot of you know as a coach like that's very easy to do it's like okay if it works for this guy it should work for everyone and and if it's not then you're the one that's wrong and not only does that not work for you know a 5'2", 120 pound woman, it also doesn't work for a 45 year old dude that's like fit and athletic, but has different concerns and is not is not 24 years old anymore and needs to train differently and needs to train smarter or, or you know, when you have different body types paired with each other. Like we're not all the same body type. We're not all the same strength. We don't all have the same experience. And if you're coaching to one idealized person, imaginary person, like it's going to be bad news for everyone, for really for everyone, because not only does that person not exist, but you're creating an environment that, that doesn't, uh, that even for that imaginary person, isn't going to be great because all of their training partners are struggling. So, um, so like, that's, you know, that's like a big grand concept, but like, what are some more specifics around that? And essentially, the, it's the idea that um, you know every person, like if we're coaching the person that in, that's in front of you, that everyone is a weight class and an experience level, and and that everyone has different adrenaline responses. And that's the place where kind of you know some of the things that are like ah girls, girls do things different. That's one of the places where it actually like shows up the most is that adrenaline response piece. And so like. Uh, we'll just, I mean, the weight class one is obvious experience level, you know, also when you're, when you're talking to people and when you're coaching, uh, new people always find out what their experience is. Like, have they done other sports? Were they a dancer? Were they, did they do gymnastics? Did they run? Did they play hockey? Um, for Bo Hurt in particular, if they played hockey, you're going to have a really nice, easy time coaching them. <laughs> um, cause they basically can do your sport, but on ice skates. Uh, and including weapon skills. Uh, but like dancers are also like dancers and gymnasts are like, they may be smaller, but gymnasts are fucking fearless. Like they fling themselves at a bajillion miles an hour into the air and like trust that they know what to do and not die when they hit the ground. Like, so there's some fearlessness and some really exciting things that you can pull out of that. Um, that if you know that background, now you also have a common language that you can talk to them with. And as well as just being able to kind of know like what their physical sense is. Um, but then the, the adrenaline response piece. So this is the place where it's like, 
there's, there's a bunch of different ways that people respond to adrenaline dumps. And one of them is crying. Uh, so, can I, can we, can you define adrenaline dump for in case anyone watching doesn't know what that is before we, before you go into the responses on it? Yeah. So just, um, if you're doing in stuff and like, you know, there's the extreme version of like, you get hit in the face and your brain goes into like major fight or flight mode, dumps a whole bunch of adrenaline into your system and because you need, you're in danger and your body's trying to get ready to do something about this danger. Um, it also happens when you're responding to a shitty email from your boss at work, uh, which is uh, real hard because if there's not a bear to run from. Uh, so, so you, you can have these big adrenaline dumps, like when, uh, you know, when you, like, we all get them when we're doing sparring or, or, you know, like you can have the big out of control ones that happen when something, you know, sort of unexpected happens, or even just like, like the sort of slower one of like adrenaline building over the course of a practice because things are getting hard and really stressful and you're having a really hard time with things. And and so everyone has, there's like several different ways that like are very normal and natural that people respond to adrenaline that can include crying, feeling numb, feeling very happy, feeling very angry, um, and a handful of other ones that are kind of all these things that it's like, this is your body responding to, to this adrenaline. Um, I personally do my stupidest shit when I'm very happy from adrenaline because I don't recognize that it's an adrenaline response and I'm just having fun. Um, when I'm angry or sad or crying or feeling numb, I tend to do better, a better job of like, oh no, something's wrong. I'm going to sit down until it stops because I know that my brain isn't doing all the things that it's supposed to do. Um, but like, so, but basically all of these things are really normal ways that we respond to adrenaline and doing fighting sports creates a lot of adrenaline. And, uh, you know, but the thing is, is that a girl starting to cry in practice is the same response as a dude getting super aggro and becoming uncontrolled and danger and a dangerous training partner. Um, and like that's, that needs to be managed just as much as a, a girl getting upset and starting to have an emotional breakdown. Like there's, they're actually the same thing. And so as a coach, you need to be able to recognize these things for what they are and, and work with them accordingly. And, you know, a great sort of gender situational neutral way of dealing with this as a coach in terms of actionable items is going and talking to them and being like, hey, you seem to be having a big adrenaline response. Maybe let's, do you need to take a break? Do you need to sit down? Do you need to take a walk? Um, and, and just like addressing it for what it is instead of ignoring it and, and like just expecting them to kind of figure it out. Um, cause you know, there's nothing, cause just, you know, like much like, you know, if you tell a person having a panic attack to calm down, that's about as, you know, it's like the least useful thing you can do. Um, no, and trying to not cry big is a really great way to just lose it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so, but that like, but that happens to all of us. Like literally on Friday, I was doing some, uh, some training with my partner, Andrew, and I ended up getting sort of stabbed in the eye twice with a foam stick. Um, and the first one was no fun. And then on the second one, like, I kind of like it, it hurt. And also like, it's my eyes. I get a little upset about them. And I like, I started crying and, and was like really, really upset. And, and, but very much like, like I wanted to keep training and I wanted to keep doing it. I didn't want to completely stop, but I just like, you know, actually told like, was like, I just need a minute and sat there like with my hands over my face, kind of crying and just like trying to take a moment to breathe until like I calmed down enough and then was able to like get all, wait until all that adrenaline sort of worked itself through my system. And then was like, cool, can we switch to a different weapon and keep doing this? So then we started playing with knives. Um, and, <laughs> uh, but, it, but then we were able to like finish out the time that we had set aside to do this because 
he let me like deal with my feelings until they were dealt with and then we could move on. And so like knowing this as a coach and that like this kind of stuff is going to happen. And sometimes it's a little less obvious than getting stabbed in the eyeball, but sometimes, you know, sometimes it's not. And sometimes, you know, and just like, if you're seeing someone having a stressy, stressy sort of moment, just ask them if they need a break. Um, and, and that's like the biggest thing in terms of like, that's probably the most like, ah, girls sort of thing that I think coaches have to like encounter. And, and it's, you don't actually like need to do anything to fix it. You just need to give them the space to have some feelings and let them work themselves through and then get back to it. Um, because that's the thing with like, you know, anyone that's doing this sport, like we're here cause we want to be, and we're excited about doing this. And some of this, like, you know, you can't always control like when adrenaline is going to do its thing. That's kind of like the point of it. And so just like being okay with letting, you know, letting people have that. And, you know, and also, so, you know, and again, checking in with them and it's about asking what they need and not telling them what they need. Um, because sometimes like, you know, and I have definitely been in this space as well, which is that like, what I actually need is like, I'm sorry, but can we just pretend I'm not crying and keep going? Because like, I can't stop the tears at this point, but I know that I can keep doing the drill and I can keep working through this. So like, let's just keep going. Um, because I actually do know that I'm fine. Um, and it's just going to take a minute for my, my face to get itself back together. Uh, but like, so that kind of stuff. So check in with your partners and ask them what's going on and ask them if they need space. And if they do, then give it to them. And if they don't, then keep going. Um, and, you know, if you as a training partner are like, actually, I'm really having a hard time continuing this drill, like with you being upset, that's also okay. And ask if you can train, if you can switch training partners for the rest of this drill or until like you can take a time to, you can, until you can get things back together. Like, and that's all okay. And we're gonna get to this a thing in a little bit as well, that it's like this, that the big thing is about making safe environments where people can, can fail and have it be messy and have, and not have everything be perfect. And so that they can be in a space where they can feel safe enough to keep trying and keep learning. Um, and, and so that all kind of goes into this th notion of making a safe training environment that's not only fa safe physically, where you're not, where you're trusting that your opponents aren't going to just deck you in the face randomly, or that they're going to like have enough self control to not break your arm while they're practicing arm bars, but also that like you have room to deal with your feelings when you know your brain's putting you in emotional arm bar, <laughs> um, and so that's the kind of so that, that stuff. Page one, complete. Page one, all right. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, I guess uh, that'd be a good spot. I mean, do you have, do you have any? I, I have a bunch of stuff. Uh, yeah. We don't have any questions from the chat that I can tell, though Julie did say that if you get stabbed in the eyeball, crying's good because it'll get the particulates out, so. True. Yeah. Um, Josh gave some uh, stuff basically saying the same stuff about what adrenaline does to your body. So, but anyway, um, I, so one of the problems I've had as a coach and as sort of a, a leadership person is when someone, I come from a very uh, toxic masculine background. I believe in don't show your fucking emotions. Anger is okay, but then you gotta like get over it real fucking fast. Like you can't be like visibly angry, but like that one, I get you get a pass. Everything else, no pass. Um, so if someone cries or whatever during class, during um during an event, whatever, I don't know how to. How do I go and talk to them and say, hey, you're an adrenaline and not be like, draw a bunch of attention to the fact that you're having an emotional outburst because you probably don't want that. Like, I know yeah. I wouldn't. And also, as a coach and uh, I, as an instructor, I don't want people paying attention to you. I want them paying attention to the shit they're doing. Um, so, like, how do, how do you approach that and have that conversation and make it not like 
you know, make it not calm down. You're having a panic attack. Like, how do you? Because that's what it sounds like. If you're just like, oh hey, do you need a break? Because you're crying. Yeah, no, that that is a that is a very good good question. Um, you know, I'd say that like there's kind of like sort of two like a, two forks in the decision tree. Um, and thing one is like, are do does it look like them being upset is degrading their performance in the drills? Um, are they really really struggling and like in a way that is becoming dangerous or becoming like that they're obviously not learning anymore? Um, and and that or are they are they just kind of having a hard time but like be, like toughen through it and if they're just if they're continuing to tough through it then let them do that because that's like you know like they have it under control and learning to like be able to work through this stuff like is important again a thing like i have a lot of feelings um and i deal with this stuff on a pretty regular basis of like also i have a like in all of my practices i i train with my like romantic partners and so like that adds like this other fun layer of like having to deal with my feelings in weird ways so like there's a lot of this that I have to deal with and that but but being able to push through it is a thing that like you know I personally will challenge myself to work on and it's like okay like I'm having a hard time and I really want to stop I'm going to do like two more drills or 10 more minutes or this or that and like I will set those internal markers for myself and then often I will be able to go farther but like that's a thing that like, if I'm on, if I feel like I can deal with it, like I've dealt with that already inside and, and just need to keep going. But then there's other times um, where like, you know, like the people are visibly upset and it's messing things up or they're like, you know, starting to like have more physical kind of stuff. And that's the place where it's just like, you know, like you can, there's a lot of sort of redirecting kind of techniques of like, you could, you know, start the class on a different drill or, Hey, we're going to do this. And then like, while everyone is mingling, like pull them aside or just say, Hey, we're going to take a break, you know, like water break. And then you can like, you know, either just let them do like deal with themselves in the water break. Or if it's like, seems like it's a real big thing, like, Hey, you know, quietly that like, Hey, do you want to like sneak out for a second? Um, and give them giving them that opportunity to kind of like go quickly and and deal with things elsewhere and you know or like sometimes it is you know like much like you'll get this more with when guys are being really aggro because they won't stop because like that's kind of part of it is like no gotta keep going and i'm tough and it's like rah, rah, rah. and that's when you like you literally have to sit guys down and yeah. like it's like kind of okay to like in certain cases, if it's really clearly affecting, like if it's really spilling over, being like, hey, I think you need to go take a break. And like, you know, you don't need to necessarily be like super, like there are lots of ways to not super draw attention to it, just in the like, you know, but being gentle and being like, hey, do you need to go sit down? Do you need to go get some water? Like is, and just keeping it real simple is how I would say, to address that so one thing for me as well is like like i i think i know how to address the the anger one because i have anger problems <laughs> um so i've been on that side um but like i also know that like if someone just came in and like i don't have a relationship with them and like they're getting they're getting angry and like that if I were just like go sit down, I know I know exactly how that goes. They don't listen to me because I don't have that relationship. And I and if you tell someone they're angry, their immediate response is I'm not angry, 100% of the time. Right. No one no one hears that and goes, oh you're right, I should calm down. Um, <laughs> you immediately you go fuck you, I'm completely in control. So, do you think that like, do you think it's patronizing or a good idea or in between? Uh, to like pull people aside on the first class and be like, hey, this is an adrenaline response. I don't know you. I don't know how you handle it. I don't know your knowledge of it, but this is what could happen and how we deal with it. And do you have any specific ideas? Like, I feel like if I pulled, I feel like if I heard that from someone, I would feel talked down to, but I don't know a better way of addressing it beforehand. And it feels like a thing you almost have to address beforehand. 
Yeah. I mean, honestly, I would say that literally exactly what you said was perfect. Okay. Um, I think that like that part of the, the reason of saying something like, Hey, you're having an adrenaline response is about making it a little bit more scientific and not getting all up in their personal business. Right. And that, and again, like the verbiage of saying like, this is how we deal with this stuff here. What is good for you around this? Um, is also really important because it's an inclusive sort of way of saying things. Like anytime that you use it, like, hey, we don't do that here, or hey, this is how we do things, is an invitation to be a part of the group. Okay. And and that doing and that is like super, super important and makes them like will actually, even if like in the moment they're still kind of like, oh, like I think it actually does go a long way in terms of making people feel more welcome in the long run once they've been able to calm down and actually like again you can't really hear much of anything when you're in that adrenaline response but once it goes away like the stuff that remains is that like hey these people like they were trying to help me um and that as a coach it is your responsibility to maintain a good environment in which everyone can learn and part of that is not you know not letting aggro dudes aggro all over the place when they can't control their anger like that's like you can't have a safe constructive training environment with that like you know you also can't have one if like people are just crying all over the place like you need to go deal with that and then come back when you're in a place to be a good training partner like all of these like big over the top adrenaline responses need to be dealt with at like on the side until you know you can rejoin with a clear head so we we've also we've talked about uh anger and we've talked about sadness but you said joy was another uh, adrenaline response um is that a thing you have to worry about as a coach like if people start getting like hyper is that a danger because you said you fucked yourself up a couple times like as a coach watching if you see people start to essentially act high should you like do you have to worry or is it kind of just like hey please calm down so that we can be focused or is it like a hey please calm down so you don't fucking kill somebody I mean, I think it definitely depends on the, like, how big a thing is happening. But, like, yeah, like, if someone's getting, you know, uncontrolled, they're starting to do reckless things because they're, like, having too much fun. Like, yeah, you should turn it, you should, like, intervene a little bit and kind of get them to tone it down. And, like, hey. I have permission to be Let's get that, like, hey, we're, we're, this is the drill we're doing. I need you to focus on the drill. Or, like, hey. Like you're getting a little uncontrolled and you're sparring. Like I know that you're having a good time, but I need you to, like focus on this thing. Or you know, if you want to be even more subtle with that, like with the sparring thing, give them a specific goal to focus on. Um, that because if you're just like sort of like wildly going on the thing, like going all over the place, it's like okay, hey, I want you to focus on on getting this specific combo or doing doing this specific piece of footwork and try to do that three times in this next thing. So then it's giving them something to really focus on instead of just like calm down. Um, and that kind of gets into some stuff that actually we'll be talking about later as well. But like in terms of coaching cues that are really good, um, telling someone to not do something um, is always worse than uh, telling them to do a thing. So uh, weird, you know, what weird i know um but like (laughs) sorry uh you know one of the one of the really like most poignant coaching moments that i think i've ever had was um like this is a this is a concept that i know of and like it has been very ingrained into me and i was teaching blade grabs and uh to do like you do you you grab the blade and then you twist in like that um and this person was like pulling it down really hard and i was like okay don't don't let your hand go below your elbow and immediately they drop they pulled the blade down the lowest they had done it the whole time and i was like oh right look at this illustration that i just gave myself um keep your hand above your elbow and then they did it perfectly like and 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 that being that distinction of if you're giving people positive external cues um if they will you'll get better results so in the same way of like if you're trying to redirect energy giving them something to do is uh 
you know, particularly with that, that more fun energy, like, Hey, try this specific thing, focus really hard on this specific thing. Um, two, I have two more things. So you talked about weight classes and you said that's obvious and I disagree. That's not <laughs> obvious. Um, like, so when I roll jits, we don't, we just go, everyone goes with everybody. Um, but admittedly, part of the nice thing about our jujitsu gym is that like white belts don't get to roll until our fucking professor tells us they can, and then they can't challenge up. So basically all your spazzy people who would have anger, who haven't worked through how to like handle their adrenaline shit, they're not allowed to go unless they're going with experts. I don't, we don't have anything like that at our gym. And I don't know of a good way of doing that in bow herd in general. Um, and so that's sort of like a, but like we still, you still fight. Like I fight, uh, two, 300 pound men. And if any, like if you come in and fight in a co-ed, you're going to be fighting the same dudes. Right. So like, yeah. So the, the point of that is not about, um, a proscriptive sort of thing. It's more of a descriptive point and that, um, it's not that like, well, you're this weight class, so you can't do anything with this weight class. Um, but it's more about like, if I'm approaching, so if I'm talking to someone about say how to do a throw and I'm talking to someone who is five, two and 120 pounds versus if I'm talking to someone who is six, two and 250 pounds, um, some of the principles of, of doing this throw are going to be the same, but there are other things that I'm going to have to like change in the way I'm coaching them because they need to accommodate their body size. And when, and equally, if I'm putting those two people together in a fight, that's different. And I'm going to give different coaching advice and different, um, you know, different coaching advice to each of them uh, for that fight than I would if they were fighting someone of the same size. Um, and that's more, that's like the point there. But the other, and then the other piece of that is that, uh, a man who is 5'3 and 150 pounds is not that deep. Like, I'm going to give him very similar coaching as I am going to give a woman that is 5'3 and 150 pounds. Um, their experience levels might add some other variation in there, but that those two people are going to get very similar advice. But I'm not, you know, in the same way that I'm not going to give the dude different, like the same exact advice that I'm giving someone that is 6'2 and 120 pounds. Like, like all of that is different, but the, the point is, is that a man and woman of the same size should be getting similar coaching and should not be getting the same coaching that I give to someone much, much larger than them. Okay. That makes sense. Um, last one before, uh, that I have for your first page. <laughs> um, um, and maybe this is, would be better talked about later on. I don't know if you have something to come up, but you're talking s somewhat about, um, contact, but you know, two people sort of wrestling together and, how do you deal – do you have any thoughts on how you deal with either the the male ego of, like, I have to put a woman in the place, the male protectionism of I I cannot go hard, e like, not even in sparring, but, like, I can't hurt this person so they don't do the drill right, um, or the issues of either gender feeling – I guess there, there also might be women who feel scared of men because of whatever, and then also – the last of people who have who haven't been in physical contact with people of the other gender because our society's super shitty about that and so they have hang-ups on on that so do you have any thoughts on that at all on any of those things yeah um first off like those are all really hard concepts <laughs> and that like yes. are definitely a big deal and like um you know like one of them is that like they need constant dialogue, particularly if you're getting new people involved um, or bringing a new person into an established group or whatever, you know, any combination thereof. Um, like having an active dialogue around how like you as a group do that is really, really important. Um, the the Wait, easiest can, answer... Can, can yeah. I, when you say having an active dialogue, is that an active dialogue among the trainers or an active dialogue among the full community of the gym? I would say the full community, like that's, okay. if you're, if you're having a mixed gender environment, like that needs to be kind of an ongoing sort of thing. Yep. Cause there's, there's a lot of factors 
around there. Like the, one of the easiest ones is like guys who don't want to go hard on women um, is uh, like when I, when I was training at uh, Ivan Salivary's uh, MMA gym here in Seattle, like one of the things that they always say is like, don't be a shitty training partner, go hard on them. Um, and that, and that really emphasizing that like you, like if you are dummying up your, on your skills, you are depriving your partner of an opportunity to train. Um, and that like they're these, the women that are here are here for a reason and you need to treat them as equal training partners. Um, and, uh, and then with kind of that as, you know, this applies to, to going too easy on women, but also on ongoing, like doing, going super aggressive to like, so you can't get beat by a girl, yeah. um, yeah. is that like the emphasis on like, we should always be using good control and good skill. And if there's a drill that you're doing and you are finding yourself like either speeding up the tempo or using excessive force that's outside the parameters of the drill or doing maneuvers that are outside the parameter of the drill just to not lose, like you're being a bad training partner. It doesn't matter who you were doing with that with. And like, hey, check yourself. Like you, you do that all the time with the girls. Like you need to knock it off and do the drill. Um, and, and, and being on top of that as a coach. Um, the stuff with, you know, there, there's certain degrees in terms of like be, getting used to touching each other at all. Um, there are ways to like ramp that up, you know, in a, inside of a practice. You know, we'll, uh, I think there, there's a drill that, that we'll do the pressure drill, which I think you saw, but basically it involves like push, putting your hand on the other person's chest and pushing on them. And that there's like, you can do that with an open palm and it's like, like, and that like very specifically describing the spot that you're like, don't choke them out and don't cop a feel like you're aiming for the sternum. And so being descriptive of where you're trying to put your hands. Um, and then you can also like, okay, if you're uncomfortable with that, you can do it with a fist. If you're really uncomfortable with that, you can put a glove on, um, but you still need to be, this is the spot that you need to push. If you're pushing on their shoulders, it's not giving them the same feed and it's not doing the drill. Um, so this is what we're asking you to do. And if you're really, really uncomfortable with that, like maybe this week you can do it with another training with just dudes, but like we're in a mixed environment and you need to like come to terms with that because this is the group that you've joined. Um, and, you know, but like as a coach, you can talk to them about that. And depending on how like willing you are to deal with that emotional labor, you can like help coach them through that and work on it. Um, or, you know, this is a, a good place where like, if you, you know, when you have more female coaches that like doing, I think doing a drill with the coach can be a lot less, like, there's a lot less like weird, like weirdness about it because like, you know, that like they're in charge. And so it's like, okay. And they're really, really giving permission to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's a place where that can also be useful, um, and potentially deal with that. And then what was the fourth one? Uh, it was so I I've experienced um, a certain number of women who come in and some men too, but it's it more uh, in the women I've seen of a fear of the larger right. opponents in particular, um, and in generally in particular of the men of like, hey, this man's larger than me, and I don't want to commit to the drill, or or I'm as they commit to the drill, I back off too much. Um, um, not even in, we're not even getting into sparring and there's this hesitancy yeah. um, and I don't so, know how to coach past that right so I mean I think there's a couple ways um, you know having more women there so that they can like learn the drill with a woman and get comfortable doing it and then continue experimenting and trying the drill with other men um, but if like and giving them you know like this is a long like easing your way into it sort of path but like yeah if you can if you can learn it in a place that feels a little safer and then go and try it with other people um as well as you know as the coach knowing 
who's in class and don't pair them with the one that needs to take out their their issues with women like who who constantly has that problem don't do that like you can actually intervene on that one it's like hey you guys are not going to be training partners on this one um and you know or having a few guys that you know are really good and have really good control and asking them to work with like women they're a little more afraid um and sort of helping them learn that it's okay and that uh and that and and you know and if it really is continuing to be a problem like then there might be time to be like okay hey like this is the environment that we're in and like you need to be able like like we know that guys like that this is scary and this might be like bringing up past trauma and how can we help you work on this because like we need you to be able to function in this training environment as much as the guys need to be able to not take out their aggression on women like these are both like the two ends of the spectrum and both need to be addressed and just letting them fend for themselves on it is the thing that like that that creates a an unsafe training environment and drives women out of the sport yeah yeah and and that's i definitely think something that i've struggled with just because i I legit don't really know how to navigate it. So this is great. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, and and I mean, it's really like, like, you know, it's about coaching the person in front of you and talking to them and asking them questions. Um, And, you know, some things that you can, some things you can kind of like deal with in the moment with just kind of redirecting things and managing stuff that way. And sometimes you do need to just have a conversation. and like again if you have a female coach uh bring them along like and that that's not you know for a lot of reasons that is helpful (laughs) uh and don't be afraid to like to do that because it's about making them feel safe and and making them feel like they are valued as training as a part of the community and that you want to help them succeed and that you're trying to find ways to do that. Yep. Um, another one is to listen to them when they say that someone's being a shitbag. Like, if if a female trainee comes to you and says, this person keeps fucking with me, like, you need to listen to them and either, can like, and probably address it head on with the person in question. And then also help make sure that they don't get paired together in drills. Um, cause like, you know, this is the thing that I've had a lot with, with Lonin, our, our HEMA group is, you know, guys that come through and sometimes they like, you know, a lot of, cause like a lot of this, like martial arts has a really high turnover and they might not even be here for longer than three months. So it's not, so it's like, so sometimes the answer is in fact, just like, don't pair them until the, until one of them goes away. Right. Um, and or, you know, if it, or if they're coming to all of the same practices all of the time and they're continuing to be a problem, then like that does in fact need to be addressed more head on and actually dealt with. And, you know, because there's probably a lot of other issues going on there as well, but like the girl getting fucked with is the one that like gets brought up, but like he's probably being a shitty training partner of the dudes too, because he's probably being over aggressive and not doing the drill and and having a bunch of other like quieter issues yeah i was gonna say that that definitely seems like regardless of who brings it up if someone brings up someone's yeah. being a dick probably deal with the dick because <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah those are my questions on page one thank you those are very good questions thanks um and then so then the, we get to the the second part um which and the dog we get a dog also molly is having opinions um molly why 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 come hang out molly come hang out okay so the 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 headline of this next broad point is um over coaching is bad for everyone um Uh oh and and then the sort of the subtext um is that this that the uh that this is all about 
I mean, it, the first part is kind of about this too, but um, creating a, a safe coaching environment or training environment um, for everyone. There's uh, in this book that I highly recommend. Um, here we go. So this book, Fear is the Mind Killer by Kaya Sadowski. Um, she's uh, an amazing, uh, primarily HEMA pr practitioner and coach um, and runs a school in Vancouver, Canada, um, Valkyrie Western Martial Arts. Molly! Stop it! Um, shouting at your dog is a very effective way of getting them to stop barking. Yeah, it's, it's much like telling someone to calm down <laughs> in a panic attack. <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna, I don't, I'm gonna go see what's, here's a real quick. Okay. Um, hey, chat, does anyone have questions uh, that haven't been brought up since we've lost our, oh, we're back. Oh, we have a puppy. Look at this. She's gonna join us. <laughs> um, anyway, so so this book, Fears the Mind Killer, is about um, basically like to me, like kind of this whole thing that we're talking about, but in, in much more detail around the notion of creating um, safe, try like environments where it's okay to fail and you feel both physically and emotionally safe so that you can really. Uh, step outside your comfort zone and learn hard uh, and and really be able to push yourself in a way that is much, much harder if you are constantly trying to look at for dealing with harassment or dealing with like all of these other issues and and not able to actually just focus on training. Um, so from, for both, so it's, I mean, it's a, for if you're trying to learn how to be a better coach to women or minorities or of like or the queer community like all of these things like there's a lot of really really amazing resources in this book and I really really highly recommend reading it um but one of the things that she points out in here um there's a quote from rory miller uh who uh, i think it was from his blog uh but that for for self-defense training first you must make an emotionally safe place to practice physically dangerous things. And then you must make a physically safe place to do the emotionally dangerous things. Um, and, you know, Kaya goes on to like, talk a bunch about how we're, you know, we're very good. Most of the time we're pretty good at making physically safe places um, and forget about that first part. And that that's like really, really, really crucial. Some of the, like the obvious things are it's like, you know, come from things like code of conduct around like, we're not using racial slurs um, or you're not allowed to hit on your, you know, female, you know, you're not allowed to hit on people. Uh, and those are the really obvious ones, but like there's- You are allowed like, to hit people though, right? You are probably allowed to hit people with consent. Okay, just check. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean like, you know, this is one of the things that, you know, the event, that I run uh, Sword Squatch, like has become, and it was from the very beginning, but like we really, really, really aggressively um, like drive the the very queer friendly um, aspect of, of that event. And like there's literal rainbows and glitter and neon pink on all of our stuff. Um, and that, you know, the, the cliff notes of that is that the, you know, when everyone feels safe, they can train really hard. It's not about making an environment that's like, that's somehow easier on the gays to like, that takes it, like that takes it easy on them. It's about not making it harder because they're <coughs> gay so that they can just hit, like they can just train real hard. <laughs> um, and it's about like just all of the stuff of making this an emotionally safe place is about removing extra like removing removing these emotionally dangerous things and um, emotional burdens so that you can just focus on the training and get very good at that like the world is full of emotionally burdensome shit and like you can you work on that stuff in therapy and we shouldn't have to deal with that in the place that we're trying to train these very hard very like often scary physical skills um so there's a lot in that around, um, you know, in, in terms of stuff that like, like small things in terms of 
um, culture and and other things that you know she covers really well in the book. Um, but the one really specific one that I want to talk about because because uh, it's the one that that I also see affecting you know it definitely affects guys, but I think it's you know one of the things that comes up constantly in these conversations that I've had you know with other women in the sport uh, is is basically around the topic of overcoaching and and how you know I know like I know for a fact that this is always coming from the best place and guy like guys are trying to help they want you know they want women to be better they want women to succeed they want them to know all the things and you're you're just you're actually making it worse um and creating making it so that you know the women you're trying to work with either low-key or or very like explicitly don't trust you because they can't be vulnerable around you because if anytime you do anything in front of them like you have a five paragraph essay on what they did wrong every time something happens all that really does is make it so okay if i don't do this exactly right i'm gonna get a fucking lecture and oh i think i did it right but hey look they found another thing that i did wrong and are explaining it now in detail despite the fact that i'm trying to like i just want to do the thing um and so this is like this is the bad thing that happens and i'm going to talk about ways to not do that the first one is if you are not the coach shut your fucking mouth um if you are the person in charge of the class we will talk about that next but if you're not the coach stop coaching your training partners like don't even if they're a guy don't do it just don't just do the drill um if they're doing something explicitly dangerous tell them to stop if they are doing the drill completely wrong ask the coach to come re-explain it if they ask you for specific feedback you can answer that question and then get back to the drill it's not an opening to go off on a dissertation on why they're doing all the things wrong. Answer the specific question. But if you're not the coach, your job is to train and be a good training partner. And that doesn't involve explaining lots of things. It is doing the drill and doing the drill the best you can. So shut up, just, just stop, just, just stop. Um, if you are the coach, uh, creating a, so, you like the the goal here is to create a culture where it's safe to fail, um, and that because uh, when because failure is the place where you learn things. Uh, like, you know, if you like, what do you think is the better way to learn? Like having someone like walk you through every single step and holding your hand the whole way, or sort of giving you an explanation and then giving you an opportunity to try it until you can get it right. Um, you know, guys are stereotypically like don't like to read instructions. They just like to do it. Uh, this is kind of, there's a reason for that is because you don't really like it when someone is like walking you through a thing and telling you what to do and you want to have the opportunity to try it out and figure it out and make it and, and learn a thing while you're doing it. And that's the same thing that kind of happens like in martial arts and coaching and learning a new physical skill is like having that opportunity to try it is really important because not only does it give you more of a sense of self-reliance and agency, but also like you literally, you physically, like you retention is better if you can find it for yourself than if someone puts your hand in exactly the right spot every time, like you don't actually remember that. Um, there, uh, just again, talk, just, continuing on that like so 50 to 70 percent success rate is the ideal um like uh rate or spot for learning um if it's below 50 percent i mean anything actually quite you know that like at one percent you will eventually learn it but anything below 50 percent success um and it is discouraging and unless you're like really like driven about shit uh like you're not going to get as much out of it um and then either if everyone is like at below 50% in a class, you should make, you should like maybe take this, take the drill back a step and try 
like explaining or explaining things a little bit different because something's probably wrong with the drill. If it's just one or two people, then maybe just like re-explain things to them. Um, or, or maybe they need a whole lot more skill development and like you need to like really change things. Or maybe this week we're just going to let them do it and like we'll talk about it later. Um, but so like, so again, below 50% um, is not great, but also above 70% success. Um, now you need to make the drill harder because just doing it right every single time, you're no longer learning things because you're no longer problem solving. Um, but so yeah, so we want to live in that range of 50, per, 50 to 70 percent success and that uh, and part of being in that range is letting people try things and experiment in that zone. Um, some other I'm gonna kind of come back to that. Um, oh, you know, I put those at the end for a reason. We're gonna come back to, to how to how to manage that a little bit better. Um, but so when, but again, if back to that point of if you're if you're over coaching on every single on every failure, um, what you're not doing is giving them an opportunity to figure to work it out and get it right. Most people know when they fucked up. Um, a lot of times, like you, you, like you. Some people are like there is definitely a range in which like they're too dumb to they they don't know enough to know what's what's going on. Um, but like, you know, if you kind of know what's going on, like oh no, you like you you know in a rep like oh I did that wrong. Let me try again. Oh now I did it right. Um, you know, or you know that it doesn't like this isn't feeling right, and give but just giving them an opportunity to try a couple more times can can help, can let them find the right thing, and uh, and then they'll hold on to that better. Um, yeah, and that okay. That's there's the point. This part of my notes got a little. I jumped around a little. <laughs> Um, but that, that basically in, not only does, you know, if you're over coaching them, it's not giving them a, an opportunity to work through that failure and, and learn, but it also is like, um, creating this, like the social cost of failure. And that, um, if you are over, if you're coaching them on every single mistake and on every single thing, like it's, it's creating this environment where they're always getting put down and getting told that they're doing things wrong and not having any of their successes celebrated and, and feeling like they constantly have to prove themselves. And if they don't do it right, they're going to be like, everyone's going to see them getting talked to by the coach again about this thing and, or feeling like you're holding everyone back because every time you do something, the coach has to stop everything and explain all these things. And particularly if, like particularly if male coaches are only doing it to the female students um, or primarily doing it to the female students, it even further singles them out and they see other people getting to fuck up and get to try again, but they get singled out and get uh, all of these things pointed out about what they're doing that's so wrong. Um, so again, this thing that is coming from this place of trying to help and trying to like help them be better as fast as they can so that they can get up to speed with the rest of the class or or knowing that they're gonna struggle more because it's a male dominated sport, it's actually just making it worse. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, and I guess, and the other thing that um, when you got to come to New York and see that class, that that was a thing that, um, I hope it was obvious, but like that, you know, in that class, I, you know, was teaching a group of women that was sort of newer to the sport and um, on a bunch of wrestling things. And it was primarily wrestling um, and some basic, the basics of wrestling and, and standing grappling um, and then into some takedowns and some stuff. And, you know, for that class, I created a bunch of, there were a bunch of drills that like, that, you know, there was sort of a timer going and, you know, people had the opportunity to try things and mess around with things and the, and just like can sort of slowly ramping up um, 
the intensity level and the skill level of what we were doing. And that, you know, I did not give a great deal of very specific feedback. And I just let them experiment and try things and play around. And, um, you know, by the end of the class, like everyone was, you know, I mean, everyone was very much jumped in at the beginning because there was a lot of playtime sort of like feelings and like there was a lot of, um, you know, again, space to experiment and play. But, you know, by the end, we're doing these more intense competitive wrestling drills that everyone was fully participating in because they had had this opportunity to, to continue to succeed and have their successes be celebrated. And so they were feeling very confident and able to, to do this stuff um, in a way that like was fun and exciting. And they weren't being put down for getting things a little bit wrong. Um, and, and that the point there being that when women are given the opportunity to figure things out and experiment and play, they're gonna throw themselves at, at this just in the same way that guys do. Um, and, and that it's not that they have, that they lack enthusiasm or skill or desire or interest. It's that uh, they just need the opportunity to mess around. Um, so I think I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go over my action items and then on the coaching and then questions. Sounds good, let's do it. So, um, so yeah, so how do you, how do you not overcoach and how do you create environments where people can experiment and can uh, feel uh, good about stuff? Um, so the, the biggest one, and it's also the one that I give to or point out to women in terms of like, how do you deal with someone who is overcoaching you is to ask for this thing, um, but to allow five attempts before giving feedback. Um, and, and it's a good, you know, it's nice, like you have it, it's right here. You, you never, you never need to forget this one. Um, so let them try five times. Um, again, if it looks like they're actively going to injure themselves, maybe, maybe you can say something about that part, but mostly just let them try five times, even if they all are fucking up. Um, if by the fifth one, if on the fifth one, they finally get it right, praise the fuck out of that. And, uh, <laughs> which brings to the next point of give feedback on success um more than you give feedback on on failures i hate it <laughs> yeah that one is hard because uh you need it it's harder to coach because it's all like it's easier to edit and it's easier to see the things that are wrong um but seeing the things that are right um like you have to be a better coach and uh you know and and know what's know what's going on um and and when you see it you're like that you did it right that was real good um because then they can build off of that instead of not having any foundation to build on um so so again so allow five attempts if at the end of those five attempts they are still not getting it right then uh then you can get into some more hands-on coaching and either you maybe you need to re-explain the drill maybe you need to um, break down the skill a little bit more and fix this one specific part and then go back to the whole thing. Um, if, but again, if they're getting a few of them right, point out the things that they are getting right and then have them do it again. Um, and then try a few more times. Um, give uh, positive external do this sort of cues. So again, like back to that example that I used before with the, the blade grabs of, you know, don't let your hand go, do keep your hand above your elbow. Uh, do spiral in, do try to put the knife back in their belly button. Um, uh, another one for wrestling, you can tell someone to bend their knees, which is, an, which is a positive feedback, but it's an internal one. So get, get lower or bend your knees. Um, an external version of that is get under, the, get under them. Um, try to look inside their ear, try to hit them in the butt. Um, with there's wrestling ones where it's like, put your elbow through their sternum. Uh, look where you look where you want to go. So like with like head control, you want to, you know, I want to go over there. So I'm going to look with my eyes through their head to the place that I'm going. So these are all externally focused, positive cues that are giving you something that's, you know, and the farther away that you can put that goal, like physically, um, the, the better, the more effective that cue is going to be. So 
that. So positive external, do this cues. Um, give their give feedback after the attempt. So if you are trying, if you're talking at someone in the middle of a drill, um, that like they won't actually retain it. They may be able to correct and do it better, um, but they won't retain it. Um, conversely, if you're uh, uh, cornering for someone in a fight, uh, yelling at them works um, a little bit. You can tell them to do something in a match and they, will, they can't actually do it. They're not going to remember this new skill in three weeks, but you don't need them to. Like, you can work on that again later, but like, but in training context, um, if you're talking at someone while they're trying to do a skill, they're not going to remember, so don't do that. Uh, just tell them, talk to them afterwards. Um, and preferably, uh, like giving, giving a little bit of time before doing that, particularly if it's a sparring round, wait like a minute. No one's gonna, un no one's gonna retain anything if they're still struggling to breathe. Um, and then the best thing is if it's, if the trainee auto-regulates when this feedback is given. So they ask for feedback. Um, if you, again, if you're the coach, you have a little more leeway on that um, in terms of like, that's your job in training, in practice. But also sometimes, uh, you know, they're, they really aren't in a place to hear feedback and that's okay. Um, or, you know, maybe they're just having, maybe they're having a shit fucked up day and they just are trying to get through practice and let them do that. Again, if, and the back, if they're doing something dangerous, always say something. Uh, but if they, if they're trying something and, you know, and you can be like, Hey, are you ready for feedback? And they're like, no, I really want to try one more time. Let them try one more time. Um, and, and then, and then they'll be like, okay, this is still not working. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. Um, or tell me what to do. Um, then do that because they're gonna, they're like just so much more ready to hear that information and process it and be there for it. Um, you know, even like if you are in a good relationship with your training partners, like, and not in a coaching scenario, like again, ask them if they want some feedback. I have, and you know, I've had very good, like nice situations where I had a training, like a training partner asked me if I wanted feedback. I was really tired and kind of stressed out at the moment. I was like, no, I'm not ready for that right now. And he was like, cool, okay. And then later, like 20 minutes later at the end of practice, I was like, hey, do you remember that thing that you wanted to tell me? And then we were able to talk through it and then actually go over it. And I did end up really learning. And I, like, it was a really great thing that, you know, was very helpful. But me being able to like self-regulate when that was gonna happen um, made that way more useful than if he had just bowled through and said it anyways. Um, yeah. Oh, wait, that's, that's the end of, so we got, which is the, yeah. So, and ask for, ask for permission to give that and respect their answer. Never, never respect your partner's answers. Um, that's lies. Please no one take that terrible advice. <laughs> um, uh, all right. So was that, is that, do you still have another page or is this, that's, that's it. The, that's everything. what is the, that's on the page. Okay. Um, all right. So overall, sort of the three main concepts I got out of this, I'm just going to speak it back to you to see Do if it. I internalized it, um, is that one, people need to sort of, there's a, there's a self-ownership aspect on your own training where regardless of whether you are the person that is sort of struggling to create the environment or you're struggling in the environment, you need to work on becoming a better part training partner, whatever that is. Um, whether you're making it shitty for other people or other people are making it shitty for you, some of that work needs to come on you. Like you need to work on your own shit. Um, similarly, we need to take as coaches, we need to find out what people have and what their needs are, and whether that's pulling people back from something or sort of bringing them up, um, we need to put that on. But like there needs to be an aspect of making people actively work on not just being good at the sport and the skill but being good as a training partner and a, and the person there um so that was my ma main takeaway one uh is coach people not just to learn but to to be able to learn um takeaway two is shut up <laughs> uh 
um, which is going to be really hard. Um, so basically, my sort of one for that, I guess, is if you feel like you need to say it, maybe don't, and then sort of ask, like even if whether you're a coach, no matter what, pull it back. Like say your spiel, and then after you've said your spiel, don't say anything else until people are kind of coming to you frustrated. Um, does that sound like a good summary of that? <laughs> no. Somewhat. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like. Yeah, I mean, like you know, when I'm coaching a class with a new drill, it's like I'll do the drill, I'll explain the drill. Um, there are ways to explain the drill that are better than others. Like some of them, be, like for example, don't always use your best student to demonstrate the drill. Um, really? Yeah. So if you use someone that's newer or intermediate and that even is going to fuck up the demonstration, that's okay because now you can coach them through doing it, like using those external cues and using the, like, and, and coaching to coach them through uh, how to get it right. And then you've done a couple things, which is one, that it's okay to fail. Um, and it's, you very, like demonstrated that in front of the whole class. And then, and that we're not going to shame you for it. We're going to help you get it right. Um, and, and that seeing, um, and there, there's actually like, uh, at the be so in the first week or two of December, we're going to actually do Andrew's coaching lecture as a zoom thing. Um, this is my very exciting idea that I had two weeks ago. <laughs> I'm like, ah, we get that's Why didn't we do this before? Oh, right. Cause we weren't doing everything on zoom before. Um, for one, so, thank you, COVID. Yeah. Uh, so, so we're going to do that. And he'll, he has a lot more on the science around this and like, um, and studies that on motor learning that show this, but that like the, an imperfect demonstration is as good, if not better sometimes than a perfect demonstration. Because again, in seeing the places where it can go wrong, you can like problem solve in your head already as you're watching it happen or then you see the solution be given. Um, and, uh, Goodbye, and yeah, Molly. so that's, <laughs> she's done with this shit. Um, so yeah, so you can uh, do that. Okay. Um, that. That is, and that is also a good way um, in terms of uh, helping, you know, the, it's an opportunity um, to help elevate women in the class as well is making sure that you're using women for demonstrations um, even if they are not the most advanced student and they're going to do it so perfectly. Uh, but again, in that, you know, if you're using those feedback things of like pointing out like, okay, this is the thing they did right in this drill. Um, and here's a, and here, try this now, do the drill again, and then they get it right. And then like, that's a real cool thing. Um, so Oh, I lost what, what question was that? <laughs> you weren't answering your question, really. I I, I had sort of said that my takeaway on your um, thing about overcoaching was oh, that right, right. everyone should shut the fuck up and wait yeah. for people to tell you to talk. Um, but yeah, so so yeah, explain the drill. You don't have to do it with your best student. So, so that actually gives you an opportunity to explain some more things, um, but in context and not just in, in talking. Um, and then let people try it and let them try it for a few minutes. And then like a thing that I like to do is like, okay, um, everyone come back in. What, what are you struggling with? What's working? And then have everyone talk about it as a group of like breaking down, like, okay, this really worked really, really well when I did it this way. And then you can have them show it. Um, or someone will be like, I'm really, really struggling with this part. And then it's like, okay, cool. Show me. And then you can coach it through. Um, with again with those external positive cues and then you're helping this person and then someone else might be able to solve that problem for themselves um, and then you know as everyone is doing the drill and you're walking around giving you know watching pairs you know just kind of keeping your your feedback simple and uh, and on to those notes of those external positive cues right. so that would be kind of Sort of, yeah. I mean, you don't necessarily have to explain, you know, give one, you know, one quick demo or dis description of the drill and then 
let them completely fend for themselves. <laughs> uh, at the very least, you should be there if they have questions. Uh, right. But but yeah, I mean, like give them that space to experiment and and try things and. Yeah, don't um, don't interject yourself, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I forget what my third takeaway was because I've been drinking, which was not a good idea in retrospect. <laughs> uh, but luckily, this is recorded. Um, but it does bring me to a question: Will you put your notes up somewhere that I can, or can you write them up in a way that we can be like, here's the easy access bullet point version of this? Yes, I can. I can do. I can okay. Do that. Because I would like to put that up on the video when I post it. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so I struggle a lot with this not correcting people thing. Um, so I'm going to push back a little bit. Um, and I don't know if I'm correct for pushing back. But also, that's just what I do. So, um, so... Like, partially, is, is, it's how I learn. I learn better from negative reinforcement. I don't want to know what I did right. I assume I did it right. If you didn't tell me anything, I, I, it's correct. You don't need to tell me I did it well. And you tell me where I'm wrong so I can fix that. Um, that's also how I see things, right? When, I, when someone is doing a thing, I can't really see if they're doing it right, but I can be like, oh, that's out of place. And then I can sometimes walk that back into the correct option but usually i can't usually i'm be like yeah your hips not moving right i don't know what the correct thing is but that's not it um and <laughs> mikey just said he saw me as perfect as well um <laughs> thanks mikey um so um i obviously that's not great for everybody some people are, are gonna be terrible about that but I have had success with um, with being like, hey, letting them try it, and then as they're going, be like, okay, this part of your thing isn't working right. I don't know how you need to move it, and then when it's right, just be like, yep, that's it. That's good. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so I think there's definitely a, a balance there, and, and one of them, like, when I'm saying, like, they try this external cues, um, that's when they're doing something wrong, and you're not saying, like, like, oh, you did that right. Try this. Like, that's you're telling them to try this stuff on the things that they are doing wrong. Right. Um, but uh, for like in the ideal situation, um, and and this is actually a thing that I'll do with my students sometimes when we're doing sparring is having feedback buddies. Um, and so we watch each other while we're sparring, and your job is to pick out one thing that they're doing wrong, figure out what they're doing wrong. Um, and then figure out how to fix it with an external cue. And the only thing you're allowed to say out loud is what to do right. <laughs> um, and, and so like, as you develop that skill, you don't, you, like sometimes you'll start speeding past that describe or figuring out what they're doing wrong because like you start like seeing things more in the like, okay, this is what you need to do. Um, but like going through that step of like actually fully thinking out all the words of like, I mean, and if you really need to like say it out loud to someone, then like do it over there. But then the cue that you, like when you're giving them the feedback um, that you're just trying to say those positive, like the do this stuff. Um, and particularly for beginners, like that's what it needs to be is just that positive stuff. Um, because uh, even if they, claim to do well with that negative like with all of the information like they actually like they just don't know enough of the context and so it actually is just more information than is needed and isn't helpful and uh and kind of just like bogs down the thing when it's like okay i need you to do this and i need you to just do it until your body can figure it out and then once you kind of have these basics and you're like more in it physically then some of these, then we can start talking a little bit more intellectually about what's going on. But in terms of just coaching something through it as a beginner, like really, really trying to just stick to those external, like do this cues is gonna get more results. Um, when, you know, with more intermediate students um, and to advance, like there's certainly having some of that discussion um, of like, okay, here's where I'm seeing that you're doing it wrong. Um, I think that becomes useful because it can lead to um, self-correcting 
Because if it's like, oh, I'm doing that. Oh, oh, I know how to fix that. I see what you're saying. I can fix that. And then you can figure, essentially, you do that last part yourself. Um, and then it becomes a collaborative problem solving thing. Okay. Um, but even if, uh, you know, and I think that that, that like, the thing that you're describing of it's like, I see that you're doing something wrong here and I don't know how to fix it, but this is where the wrong is. Um, I think actually is, is not the worst because it's inviting a collaboration and problem solving right. as opposed to you did these six things wrong in, in this detailed exa- like way. And that just bogs people down and just makes them feel like shit. Okay. Um, like I have, I have watched it happen. Like I was at a tournament and this guy was doing the worst job of cornering ever. And literally at every, you know, and this was a HEMA tournament, like a, so like after every point and the halt and like having like a minute, you know, while the judges figure out the score, like just talking his ear off about everything he was doing wrong. And just every match, the kid did worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And then it was like kind of heartbreaking. And I wanted to fucking punch this guy in the face um, because it was like super dumb and just like, come on, man, you're like, you're literally making your person worse. Uh, because all he was doing was just explaining what he was doing wrong. Um, also, this is in a tournament, so it's even like the worst place to do that. But uh, but yeah, like just if if you're saying like just explaining what they're doing wrong doesn't result in collaboration or getting it better. Um, if it's like, hey, this is what I'm I'm seeing something going on here. Let try to focus on that spot to or like try to focus there in terms of like improving on a thing is is kind of the next step up but the even better one is like hey try this thing um because it's giving them this external focus right um and a, and a thing to to do right it's also really hard like just like this is it's taken me a long time to develop this skill um and i've had uh very good examples and and sometimes it's like like having the vocabulary as a coach to be able to to do that is kind of tricky and um you know i've been very lucky in having a lot of very good examples of of how to do that um and but but yeah kind of you know it's stuff like thinking about you know thinking about it really critically and it's like well if it's like a hip thing and and it's like okay well think about maybe like what if it was doing it right where should the hips be going and and then think about that and then it's like okay well how can i describe the path that the hips are going on in a way that's externally focused um you know one that i'll have is like um keeping good pressure like base and pressure um you know typically involves like kind of keeping keeping low uh and like making sure that your knees are bent and your hip you know like your hip pressure is in and that you're not like going up on your toes so like so thinking about that it's like okay well oh so i your head needs to actually stay at the same level so try to like as you're moving make keep your head on this same plane um I mean, and it's not don't let your head bounce up and down. It's keep your head in this plane, yep. and then then see how that works. Uh, or um, you know, drive forward with like through your hips, or keep your knees aimed at your opponent, um, and things like that. And so it kind of it takes a little bit of extra kind of thought and trying to figure out sometimes you know if you're if you're trying to struggle with those words is like break it down and it's like think about where the things should be going and then find ways to describe that right right try to try to sort of say the path out loud yeah. um, that makes sense um, i mean yeah talk things out loud just <laughs> talk that shit out loud it's like that's fine um I also want to push back, and I don't, I don't think you will disagree with this, but maybe you will. Um, so on the talk less, if you on shut up if you're the coach, um, not the coach. Um, I think that's 
like I think that's great advice in any lecture scenario. Like no matter what, if you're at a seminar, shut the fuck up. Um, if you're at a weekly type class, probably shut the fuck up. But when you start getting more into sparring and sort of workshop classes, I think you'd agree that like there's a little room to play with that. Um, or in, perhaps even in certain drills, there might be a little bit more room. And so I just don't want people to be like, take that and be like, either this means I can't talk or because I found a place when I can talk to throw that out. Like it's more, there are places where no matter what you should be shutting the fuck up. And then other places where you will probably be invited to have a say. And is that yeah, right? And that's, that's the big thing is it's like, is, is that invitation is, is the person asking you for a thing? If you're seeing something, someone repeatedly fuck up in the same way and that they're not getting it right, then it's like, Hey, can I give you a thing? And, you know, and sometimes they'll say yes, and sometimes they won't. And if they say no, you have to, like, respect that. Because right. if you keep so talking, you have destroyed all trust, and you've pissed them off, and they're not going to remember anyways. Yeah. Um, but if, but yeah, I mean, if you're seeing something, and, and you think it would really help them, like, ask if you can give them, you know, the thing, and then stick to just the, like, the one thing. Yeah. Um, and... You know, and also there's definitely like in smaller groups or in uh, workshoppy sort of things, those are places where there's going to be more discussion and it's then a collaborative process and not you talking at someone. Right. I, like uh, for my JITS class, for example, um, like when we break up into drills, like the, he's demonstrated the drill, you're breaking up and you're doing it, but it's almost always a new, you're not building off the same techniques. It's like, hey, here's an entirely new progression. Um, and so, like, half the time, we just, we're there because he'll have, like, 15 students. He can't go through them all in the t in the class. So we have to talk it out. Um, and sometimes it's real, it's that light stuff like, hey, just, you know, put your hand here. Put your hand here. And other times it's, well, what are we supposed to be doing with this? And it really is a conversation. But, like, that's yeah. always been, an, I've never had that with a, with a partner who just, like, told me this is what you had to do. And similarly, I've never done the same. It's you just sort of you start to come to a collaborative thing. And I just wanted to touch on that point. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Like, I, I totally agree with that. And like when it's a collaborative discussion or when you're asking for help um, or when you're working through something together, that is a very, very different thing. Yeah. The thing that happens with women a lot is that the guy assumes they don't know what they're doing because they're a woman and just starts talking at them and re-explaining the drill or coaching them on like on every little thing that they see wrong despite the fact that they might not be doing the drill correctly themselves I just but they just have assumed that the woman doesn't know what they're talking doesn't know what they're doing and is starting to talk at them um guys also do this to inexperienced like male partners but it is women get this all the time and no matter their skill level yeah. um and and that's the thing that is like you know, and that more so than I think some of the other things, that is actually deeply sexist and is really fucked up. And guys need to like seriously check yourself. Um, and if you're if you're constantly trying to overcoach your female training partners, why the fuck are you doing it? Are you doing it to your male partners? You're probably not. And stop it. Just stop. Like it's okay that they fuck up a little bit. They're learning like experimentation and failing is how they learn. And you are robbing them of that opportunity and making them feel like they can't trust you and that they don't know it and that they're never going to be good at this because every time they do anything, someone has 16 things to say about it. Also, in my experience, the people who are giving the advice are not that skilled themselves. Yeah. Um, it's It tends to be if you, if you are a master, in my experience, not a master, that's a, a pretentious term. If you have skill, if you have competency, you don't really you don't talk down to people you don't interject yourself you sort of wait until either the person has come to a serious frustrated point or has asked you for help um yeah. so yeah so um th that's a big frustration i've had with a lot of people um being like i let me help this person teach a concept um it's like maybe don't maybe yeah, maybe let don't. the teacher teach it <laughs> And also, like, as coaches, if you see people doing that, <coughs> tell them to shut up and get back to the drill. Yeah. Like, 
you know, you can make, you can stand in the middle and make the general statements of less talking, more doing. Um, and if they still don't shut up, then you start to getting, you get a little more pointed and be like, hey, dude, do the drill. Back to the drill, less talking, do the drill until they shut up and start doing the drill. Exactly. Yeah. Be mean to your students is what I just heard. I'm so about it. <laughs> um, I we're at an hour and a half, which is way longer than I usually go. <laughs> uh, I'm basically out of questions. Um, no one in the chat has brought anything up. Uh, I feel like we should pin to that thing you're doing in December, though. Um, if you want to talk yeah. more about Andrew's credentials and all of that. Uh, yeah, so we haven't picked a date yet, but probably the first or second week of December. Um, probably the second one, since it's a little farther away from Thanksgiving. Um, but Andrew has uh, been uh, doing martial arts for well over 20 years um, and coaching for most of that time. Um, he is uh, he's a master now uh, in Latosa Escrima, um, which is the highest rank he can achieve in that system. And there are not very many people that have that. Um, I am a two Han in Latosa Escrima. I know is, what that means. And it's, it's a word. Um, <laughs> it seemed like a word. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, he uh, is a master in Latosa Escrima and uh, has been running, uh, has run several um, schools and training clubs and is currently uh, the head of uh, Seattle Escrima, uh, as well as um, working with um, with the Lonin, um, our club up here, teaching uh, longsword. Uh, he's taught wrestling and uh, has done a lot of work with the Bohurt groups up here. Um, and and basically, his primary focus um, for like kind of like this whole time, in addition to just being very good at martial arts, is the co the science of coaching and coaching um, and motor learning and how to do that best and. Um, a lot of the stuff that I've talked about in here comes from him and also from Renee Latosa and watching them um, coach and and then talk about the science of it. And so he that lecture is uh, basically covers, uh, you know, sort of all of the science and what's, you know, when is like science, like studies that sh talking about how giving feedback too soon is bad, um, how letting people do um, random practice instead of block practice um, increases retention. Um, with block practice, you can look good as a coach because and feel real good because they all can do the drill at the end of the class, but two weeks later, they cannot. Um, whereas random practice is a lot messier and it's a little more frustrating and it doesn't look as good, but in two weeks, those skills are gonna start, are gonna still be there. Um, and, and a lot of things around that and, uh, and just how to be a better coach and also that, uh, you know, and it's it's also a good reminder, both like a lot of stuff that I'm talking about here, as well as in his lecture, that coaching is a skill and you can be a very, very excellent practitioner and not very good at coaching. And like one, that's okay. It's a whole separate skill. Um, but learning, learning coaching is neat because then you don't fuck other people up, but also like it makes you better because like learning how to break things down um, you know, like makes it easier for you to evaluate your own skills and where you're doing things um, wrong and be able to to improve that way as well. Yeah. So highly recommend that lecture. Yeah, if you are a coach or anyone at all interested in coaching or probably even just learning, it's probably good for that too. So whenever we get the details, I will share that on my page and Parath will share it like everywhere probably. So um, check it out. Go follow it. Uh, anything else you want to pimp, talk about? Um, yeah, if you want to, if you have question, more questions for me specifically, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram. Um, Beth Hammer on Facebook. Uh, Mudskipper Rodeo for Instagram. Or Beth the Hammer is the account that I have for fighting that someday I might use. But if you message me on there, then I can answer very specifically fighting questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on, uh, talking about this. This is really good. I learned a lot. Uh, 
we and thank got... you guys so much for for letting me talk for an hour and a half and yeah. uh this is stuff that is really important to me so i appreciate you giving <laughs> me the opportunity to go on about it yeah i i anytime i i'm very interested in learning and coaching um, so Yay. it's good stuff um yeah, uh, everyone in the chat says good job. Uh, Lynn disappeared, but he just came back and he's surprised. Uh, and Mikey wants you to come uh, coach him and beat him up at some point. So I, um, I can definitely do the first part soon. <laughs> I got, I got another, got another few months before I'm allowed to like get super fighty. Yeah, that's probably but, uh, true. Sad. All right. Particularly because of the world i'm gonna like actually have a be good a functioning me <laughs> yeah so april 20th <laughs> is when i can start doing right. things again covid needs to end by april 20th you heard it we're ending it by then all right thank you so much bye, bye. Good night. nope i didn't didn't work